Hello there. Good evening, everyone. This is Dari on World Streams Radio. Thank you to our listeners from all around the world for joining us tonight. If you'd like to learn more about World Streams Radio, visit our website at worldstreams.org. And now you can also connect with us on Facebook at facebook.com slash worldstreams. Our guest tonight is Esther Dyson. Esther Dyson is an active angel investor in a variety of startups for profit and otherwise around the world doing business as adventure. An economics graduate of Harvard and the daughter of an English physicist and Swiss mathematician, Esther started working in Eastern Europe after the fall of communism to help in the high-tech and venture capital sector and is still actively working in the U.S. and Europe. She was founding chairman of ICANN, the policy setter for Internet DNS, from 1998 to 2000, and was also chairman of the Electronic Frontier Foundation in the 90s. In 1997, she wrote Release 2.0, a design for living in the digital age, which appeared in paperback a year later as Release 2.1. And we're very excited and honored to have her with us tonight. Hello, Saeed. Hello and welcome, Esther. Thanks. I'm delighted. Good evening to you, Esther, and uh, good evening to our listeners from around the world. Esther, the Internet has shaped the way that we think in the present. It will shape the way that we live and exist in the future. Your thoughts? Um, I wouldn't say it has shaped the way we live. I would say we've used it to reshape the way we live. But the Internet is a tool, and we control it. So, you know, clearly we use it to do something we want to do. We may realize short-term or long-term we didn't want to do it. But in the end, we use it. It does not use us. Right. Did you envision that the Internet will be, uh, uh, while you were writing about it, uh, mm-hmm. you know, in the 80s and 90s, that it would be uh, Flickr, Facebook, uh, MySpace, and all these social media that uh, very much did not exist before? Well, you know, it's hard it's hard to I haven't reread my book and so I I certainly didn't have the names, but I did see it as very much a medium for people communicating. I saw it as a medium for in particular I remember writing my chapter on education and I wrote it about how kids would use this great software in school and the teacher would be personalized and I kept I found this pair it's chapter just really boring. I yeah, I couldn't stand writing it. And I realized if I can't stand writing it, they really can't stand reading it. What is it I'm really trying yeah. to say here? And it, I rewrote the chapter, and it ended up being how parents and kids would use the Internet. Basically, most of what I've written about and what I think about is, is the Internet puts power in the hands of individuals, and it destroys it erodes the power of institutions. And I wanted that to happen in, in education as well. It still hasn't. But to, to me, what was always interesting was the, the way it connected people and people as individuals and, and people in groups, a counter power to institutions and in you know, education in that particular example. But certainly the well already existed and, and I saw that the Internet was connecting people. So to some extent, yes, Flickr, less so, to be honest. I mean, some of the things about Flickr, yeah, but I wasn't, Flickr is a, is a really interesting service that people thought was about photos, but of course there's also that sharing. Right. Uh, uh, you said something really interesting uh, about the Internet uh, has this capability of eroding the power of institutions. Uh, that made me think of, uh, of one of the questions I wanted to ask you about uh, internet neutrality and the power that uh, the, the power of actually controlling what uh, the Comcasts of the world are doing, the Verizons of the world are doing. Do you think that uh, this is happening, or what are the forces against it? Do you think that that really internet neutrality is is something that should go in the direction of the erosion of these institutions such as Comcast. Well, 
define what internet neutrality is. That's one question. Then the second question is what it does to Comcast. But I don't know what net neutrality means. All I know is that people use it to mean whatever they right. want it in, in some political argument. So I always feel uncomfortable talking about it because I'm never quite sure what it is. I don't want to erode Comcast's power. But I do want people to have a choice between Comcast and alternatives. And I want them, I think it's entirely proper. Uh, One argument, for people to pay more if they use more and for them to pay less if they use less. So I have no problem with limits on people's use of bandwidth, for example. I I think that there's nothing else that gets sold with no, no capacity constraints. Right. What about the flow of information? Because um, there have been some allegations that Comcast was controlling some of the, the flow of information based on what they refer to as bandwidth, uh, the, you know, citing the example of BitTorrent. And uh, what about that? So that's, that's a complicated thing to unpack. Right. Of course, I don't like people controlling the flow of information. At the same time, I think that Comcast should have a right to have terms of service and, and enforce those. So if you need to get down to specifics, and then I'll tell you whether I think something is good or bad. Yeah, the, the specific part I was talking about is the, the ruling that was made uh, just this week or last week by the court that the FCC cannot uh, tell Comcast what to do as far as how it manages the flow of information between different uh, between users and and actually suppliers and users of information. Right, because it's not a public utility. It's not, you know. I, I, I personally, I think usually the best way to deal with this stuff is going to be antitrust. So then the problem is with the use of antitrust, not and and let's let's do that better. And if we if we see abuse of power, let's go after it. So you're against regulation, regulating it, whether uh, Comcast decides to, to turn the water off or somebody who is using too much or a little less. Uh, I, think, I think if they abuse their power, then sue them. I, I don't think regulation is the way to it's, – it's, it's complicated, and that's why I don't really want to get into this discussion too much because there, there are different ways to solve the problem. But by and large, if you start regulating the Internet, then – you're regulating the internet, and you might not like the next administration as much as you like this one. And right, right. You've given them the ability to regulate the internet. I'd rather just say, if if they abuse their power, sue them. Yeah. But, you know, well, when you when you wrote about the, you were writing about the internet for since since very much the the first years, the 80s and 90s, and at the time, I remember this a very heated discussion about uh, keeping the internet and commercialized. Do you agree yes. with how commercialized it has become now, or do you have any reservations about that? Um, you know, the world is commercialized. No, actually, I, I, do I have disagreements with bad taste? Of course. Yes. But again, I don't want to regulate people's taste. And in the same way, I don't want to say, oh, the internet's too commercial, so let's regulate it. I mean, again... I don't like everything that exists in the world, but the world is not organized for my my pleasure and my convenience. And I, I think, by and large, commercial spirits have given us a lot. I mean, they have created so much innovation and dynamism and feeds the world. So does that mean I like everything? No, but it means that I think it's appropriate, I guess. 